Good morning, Quinn Chapel, African Methodist Episcopal Church, and to the virtual world that's tuned into this service this day. I greet you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I pray that all is well with you as we pursue to have this, uh, uh, take this opportunity to present to you a word that comes from the Lord. Quinn Chapel, located in Frederick, Maryland, is where Jesus is Lord. And here we are experiencing his glory. We're moving forward in this year to 2023 after having been locked down and shut down for such for about three years, we are now advancing and moving forward for the kingdom of God. At this time, let me open us up in prayer. Gracious and merciful Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to worship you, to praise you, to glorify you, to exalt your holy name. For you are worthy to be praised from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. You are glorious. You are magnificent. You are our everything. You are our rock, our redeemer. You are our hope for tomorrow. Lord, we just thank you for this is the day that you have made, that we glorify you, magnify you, because we know that you have a plan for our life. Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who went to the cross, who died for us so that we may be saved from ourselves, oh, Father God. Redeem and re uh, reconcile back with you that we are not enemies once anymore. And Lord, we just thank you that through his blood that we have been forgiven of our sins, our past, present, and future sins. Now, Lord, be with our pastor, in the time that he's on the road, uh, there have been some other uh, situations that, that have come where we are all dealing with the loss of loved ones, those who are sick in the shut-in, those who are dealing with some infirmities. Lord, those who are homeless, Lord, we pray that right now, even those who are homeless because of the fires that have been raging over in, over in uh, Maui, or oh, Father God, those who are in Canada, Lord, we have other catastrophes that are going on where there's rain, floods, and, 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 and famine, and pestilence. Lord, we just pray right now that you minister to those, right, meet them right where they are, that if they hear a comforting word, word of encouragement from this word that's been presented today, Lord, let them be encouraged and let them know that they're not alone and that you are a God that will provide all that they need. Lord, we just thank you for all that you've done, all that you will do, and that, Lord, this word that comes forth, we pray, O oh Father God, that someone will hear this word and, and recognize they are sinners and they need someone in the pardon of their sins, and they'll cry out what they might do to be saved. And we know they confess their sins and receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, he who has raised them up from the dead, they can be saved. We thank you, we praise you, we glorify you in the mat matchless name of Jesus Christ our Lord. And everyone said, Amen, Amen, Amen. Amen. This morning, uh, I just want to touch base with you about a few things that we have planned on doing. Uh, today the word is going to be coming out of 1 Samuel chapter 14 and we're going to be reading verses 1 through 23. But before we go any further, I would just like to let you know that I, I was listening to the news and I was listening to uh, uh, Reverend Parker from previous times and, and it's an interesting thing that we've been praying for different places uh, around the globe. But none is more important right now is to talk about Maui, uh, as a Maui I believe it is, in the Hawaiian Islands where uh, uh, many people were moved from their homes or had to even get into the, the ocean in order for them to survive the, the, the travesty of the fire that burned so many homes and put so many people out of homes. Lord, we just uh, want to let you know that we're not just praying for those who are in this church right here. Well, we, we have a praying ministry that goes beyond these walls. It goes beyond just this city and this and this state, but it's a global prayer, uh, Father God. That I, I want you to understand that we are here to, to do this global prayer outreach ministry, so that everyone who, in the sound of my voice, will have an opportunity to be able to get a globe, and when they buy this globe, whatever globe they have, large or small, that every now and then they'll go to a troubled place in the world 
or just randomly touch a spot on the world outside of their familiar and be able to pray for the folks that live in that area because everyone has a situation they're dealing with. So it don't matter your status. It doesn't matter your, your gender. It doesn't matter what, what, what your uh, circumstances. Look to the hills where your help comes from and know that it comes from the Lord who on this day he said that he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And that is the promise. That is what we look forward to because we know that we need to have a savior that this life is not the end all but is the stepping into the eternal part which is the real life that we're going to live forever and ever with him in his presence for all eternity. So, if you have not bought a globe, by all means, buy one. And, and make sure that when you buy one, don't let it sit on a mantle and collect dust. Every now and then, go to that thing. Go to it and point out and touch a piece of, a, a, a part of the world that's in trouble. A part of the world that needs some prayer. And a part of the world where uh, persecution is taking place for those who believe in Jesus Christ as Lord. We need people who are willing to pray. And that's going to be one of the things that we're going to be talking about. Can God use you? Can he use you? That's what this word is going to be about today. And um, as I take this moment, I'm going to go ahead and uh, allow you this opportunity to look in your Bibles uh, and find 1 Samuel go to chapter 14. That's 1 Samuel chapter 14, verses 1 through 23. That's what I'm going to read from the New King James Version. Now, there's some words in there you may have trouble pronouncing, but don't get caught up in the pronunciation. Look at the message that God is trying to reveal to you. That's more significant than anything else. I'll give you the background. The other thing, too, is that I know some of you have your cell phones, you have a uh, you're on your internet, uh, Google it up. And that way we can all be on one accord when we come and look at this word. First Samuel chapter 14 and it reads, Now it happened, this is uh, Jonathan, <coughs> a story about Jonathan and, um, and his father and their and, they, and, 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 and they're confronted with the battle of fight, fighting the Philistines. So now that we have a little bit of background, now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, come let us go over to the Philistines' garrison. That is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. And Saul was sitting on the outskirts of Gibeah, under a pomegranate tree, which is immoral. The people who were with him were about 600 men. And Ahijah, the son of Ahijah, uh, Ichabob's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the Lord's priest in Shiloh, was wearing an ephod. But the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of one was Bozes, and the name of the other was Sidna. The front of one faced northward, opposite Mishmash, and the other southward, opposite Give you. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. And maybe that the Lord will work for us. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. So the, his armor bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Go then. Here I am with you, according to your heart. 
Then Jonathan said, very well, let us cross over to these men, and we will show ourselves to them. If they say thus to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. But if they say thus, come, to, come up to us, then we will go up. For the Lord has delivered them into our hand, and this will be a sign to us. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, look, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they have hidden. Then the man of the, of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we will show you something. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hands of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after him, and they fell before Jonathan. And he, and as he came after him, his armor bearer killed him. That the first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men within about a half of an acre of land. And there was trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison and the raiders also trembled, and the earth quaked, so there was a very great trembling. Now the watchmen of Saul and Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and there was the multitude melting away, and they went here and there. Then Saul said to the people who were with him, Now call the roll and see who has gone from us. And when they had called the roll, surprisingly, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. And Saul said to Ahia, bring the ark of God here. For at that time the ark of God was with the, the children of Israel. Now it happened while Saul talked to the priest that the noise which was in the camp of the Philistines continued to increase. So Saul said to the priest, Withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him assembled and they went to the battle. And indeed, every man's sword was against his neighbor and there was very great confusion. Moreover, the Hebrews who were with the Philistines before that time, who went up with them into the camp from the surrounding countries, they also joined the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise, all the men of Israel who had hidden in the mountains of Ephraim, when they heard that the Philistines fled, they also followed hard after them in the battle. So the Lord saved Israel that day, and the battle shifted to Beth Ever. The word of God for the children of God. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearers of his holy word. This morning, my brothers and sisters, I'd like to uh, bring forth to your attention these verses for my topic today. Say, are you a person that God can use? Are you a person that God can use? Are you a person that God can use. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, use this your servant in a magnificent, marvelous way, that as he decrease, you increase, O oh Father God. And Lord, let these words out of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, let it be acceptable in your sight, O oh Father God. For you are my rock and my redeemer. You are my hope, my faith for tomorrow. You are my everything, and I can't do nothing without you. So use this your servant, O oh Father God, that you speak through him mightily, that those who have an ear to hear will hear your words and not mine. That they will understand that it's through the Spirit of the Lord that we're here today and that it's no accident because he recruited to finding out to see, are you a person that God can use? Amen. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 
I like to bring to your attention these scriptures because I, I think that they are very significant for the service today. Because in verse 6, it says that after Jonathan had slipped out from the camp, he said to a young man who bore his armor, come, let us go over to the garrison of, the, of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work with for us, for nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. In other words, there is no restriction, there is no limitation of what God can do. So his armor bearer, his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Go then, here I am with you, according to your heart. Then Jonathan said, well, very well. Let us cross over to these men, and we will show ourselves to them. If they say thus to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and not go up to them. But if they say thus, come up to us, then we will go up, for the Lord has delivered them into our hand, and this will be a sign to us. The situation in Israel at that time was not very good. In verse 22 that we are reading earlier, it tells us that they didn't have good weapons. The Philistines were in control of the region and, and did not allow the, uh, the Israelites <laughs> uh, uh, to own many weapons. Israel did have a king, though. His name was Saul. But he wasn't doing much. Verse 2 tells us that he was staying, I mean staying under a tree. He was relaxing very passively, just waiting around. What you see is someone who is very passive and lethargic. Do we know anybody like that from time to time? They don't seem like they're motivated to do anything. They just want to sit around and wait and see how things turn out. It brings me to my first point because, see, in this, in this, in this story, God wants to use a person who's willing to go. The person God uses must be willing to go. God want to use you, but he can't use you if you're not willing to go. While everyone else was hiding or, or staying and laying around, being lazy and so forth, not motivated, Jonathan had a different attitude. Jonathan was active where they, they were passive. Jonathan says, come, let's go. Others were afraid. Others were waiting for someone else to do something. Others were waiting for something to happen. But Jonathan took the initiatives and, and no one made him do it, but he sees what was needed to be done and he went and did it. Throughout the Bible, we see that the primary characteristic of God was look, he was looking for this person, someone who had the willingness to go. Isaiah 6, 8, 9 says that, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go uh, for us? And I said, Here I am, send me. He said, Go and tell these people. God doesn't always choose the most educated person. Uh, God doesn't use a person with the highest IQ. God don't use the most talented person either. He's looking for people, a person who's willing. He says, who will go? And Jonathan was willing to go. So each of us needs to answer two questions for ourselves. One of them is, are you willing? Are you willing to be used by God? Sometimes we may be reluctant. We may think that we don't know enough. We may think that we are not good enough yet. We may think that no one will listen to us. Well, but God can overcome all these issues. The real question is, are you willing to say yes to God and be used by him? Oh, uh, we studied Moses many times uh, over the last few months or so forth, and we are, if we are willing, then he will help us. Moses is a, a testimony of many, had, he had many excuses to give to God for not wanting to go and not doing what God asked him to do. But one of them was that he wasn't a good talker. 
Now, I know somebody ought to say, I don't talk very well. Another might say to him, I'm afraid the people won't listen to me. I, I, finally, he, he probably said, send someone else. How many times that when God called you to do something and you said you want to give it to someone else, but God didn't give it to that person, he gave it to you. Many times God calls you to pray for someone. And what you, what you want to do is call the pastor. You want to call the deacon. You want to call a friend. You want to call a prayer warrior. When God said, I put it in you to go ahead and pray for that person. Sometimes when God has to say to you one time, somebody prayed for you, why don't you pray for someone else? Why don't we pray for someone on this globe? Someone who has a need, someone has a desire, someone who's looking for a breakthrough. Pray for them for they, until they get a breakthrough. If you still don't understand, to all these, God answer was, I will be with you. If you are willing to be used by me, then he promised to be with you each, every, each day, every step of the way. The other question he's going to ask, after you get past all you, see a lot of us are willing to do a lot of different things. But the question is, will you go? I don't volunteer for nothing. <laughs> yeah, I, I like to go. I like to be there. But uh, let somebody else do it. See, one of the things God is looking for, uh, not only should we be willing to do something, but we should also take the action. See. I think I, I see here, faith got to be introduced here because faith is not about hearing the word of God, but being doers of the word of God. How many of you have ever had someone knock on your door and say, please share the gospel with me? I want to believe in Jesus. You know, it's very rare that that would happen. You see, John just said, let's go. <laughs> in Isaiah, God asked who will go, but the Great Commission says, go. God wants you to take the initiative and go and spread the gospel. Tell them the world of the good news of Jesus Christ. That salvation is available to all. That if all, whoever so believeth in him shall not pass for have everlasting life. Because God has already made a way. Go out of your house. Get out of your comfort zones. Take the initiative to start the conversation. Ask not just your friend, would you like to meet me for lunch? I would like to share about the Bible with you. Share your testimonies. Go to your six friends and say, may I pray for you? Do something. I had a patient who was going through a hard time. Uh, that person never expressed any interest in Christ. I uh, asked the person, can I pray for you? It was, it was allowed and the, pa and the patient agreed and allowed me to do so. And so, it so touched the person's heart that the patient's eyes was flooding with tears streaming down the face. God wanted me to get out of my comfort zone and take the initiative and pray to help someone restore their hope, restore their, uh, their being, restore their confidence, to let them know that they're not alone, that there is a God that sits on high and watches low and, not, and loves them so much that he's willing to step out of his soul to be able to move in this person's life to bring them to understanding that they're not alone, that I'm always with you. Point number two is the person God uses should have a big vision. See, we see what Jonathan was doing in this passage. Jonathan had a big vision. He had a high goal. He wasn't out to catch stragglers or perhaps steal a sheep or, or carry out a raid or get a few weapons. He wanted to take out uh, the fortified outpost defended by many men. What, what do you think Saul would have said to him if he had to went to him first? Probably would have said that along the lines of, are you crazy? You're just a little boy. You're not equipped. You're not experienced. Apparently that was a reason, there was a reason Jonathan didn't tell him or anybody else for that matter. Most people's goals were very low just to survive, just 
uh, staying alive, uh, Jonathan attempted something that most people would laugh at, but he didn't attempt this on his own strength. So let me stop right here, because many times we're, 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 we're challenged when we have these big goals and ideas and so forth, uh, we, we, we go to others and, and, and look for their approvals and, and sometimes we get discouraged. We get undermined. And some people just uh, don't want you to be able to do that. Some call you crazy. Some out of your mind and so forth. How dare you want to come over and take a stand for the word of God because the world is against you. They're going to cut you, uh, undermine you, slander you, spit on you. But the thing about it, Jesus took it all in. And he didn't back down. Jonathan didn't attempt to do this on his own strength like we would try to do. He didn't think his, on his own military prowess would give him the victory. But instead, he, he placed his faith in God. He says, perhaps the Lord will act on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from say, saving us. He, he, he believed that God would be with them and, and give them the victory. He knew it was God's power. He knew that it was in God's power. He knew that God had all power and authority over the situation. He remembered his history lesson and, and studying how God brought them over the Red Sea. He remembered how they brought them into this new land. He remembered all these things that we have to understand that through this through all of this, through all of this, he'll make a way. Our view of God is directly connected to the steps of faith we take. Connected to the steps of faith that we would take. Let, 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 let me say this again. Our view of God is directly correlated to the steps of faith we take. What, what does that mean? If, if you believe in a big God, you will attempt big things for God. If you believe in a little God, you will be afraid or trying in fear that he will let you down. But I serve a God that never let you down. He never failed me yet. Amen. For example, some of you have relatives who are hostile to the gospel and seem very hard-hearted. Uh, do you believe God is big or powerful enough to change their hearts or are they a lost cause? If you believe in, in a big God, you will keep praying and you will keep sharing with this person or with whoever it is. If you believe in a little God, you will give up and say, you don't know my uncle. There is no way someone like him would ever believe in the gospel. Will you believe God is big enough to do something great? God is big enough to change the heart of most skeptical unbelievers. God is big enough to help you start a Bible study on a campus where there are no other believers. God is big enough to reach your school from the gospel. God is big enough to reach your city. He's, rich enough, he's, he, he's big enough to save your government leaders. But see, they got to have a willingness to want to receive the word. Do you know, the, do you have goals for how you can be used by God? If not, then setting goals is a good first step. But maybe today is a day we need to set our goals even higher. Are you praying for one person to trust Christ in your school? Maybe you need to pray for five, or maybe for 50, or maybe for 5,000. Are you hoping that one Bible study will start in your district? Maybe we should pray for 100, or 1,000, or 10,000. Jesus told the disciples that even faith as small as a mustard seed can grow into a great tree. Will you have the faith to set what you might seem like a huge goal and then work towards it, pray towards it, and believe that it will happen and maybe God will do the impossible? That's what we need to understand. Our faith is not based on what our expectations are. Uh, and looking at the realities of things, but our expectation should be on the hope that whatever we pray for, God will bring it to fruition. You gotta be faithful. So that means you gotta be willing to believe and then go and act because of that belief. Now the third one is the person God uses 
must have great faith. In the book of Hebrews, we talk about all these uh, Hall of Famers of faith. And here we go back and we look back at their life and see why, how did they make it into the book of uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 11. It's amazing because when we look at it, one of the most memorable phrases in this chapter is that John's an amazing statement of faith in God where he says, nothing can hinder the Lord from saving whether by many or by few. See, Jonathan knew that it wasn't about the number of soldiers. It was all about God's power. He had almost insurmountable challenge, but he believed that God's power will bring him about the victory. See, likewise, God has given us a huge task, telling us to make disciples of all nations to reach to the world for Christ. That's what we got the global prayer ministry, outreach. We can reach others. Why do you think we have the virtual internet service being utilized in such a fashion as this to be able to spread the gospel throughout the whole world, to reach those places that normally would not even get the word of God? We are blessed to be able to have, not look at the, the, the the tragedies, the negative of what COVID did, but look at this positive entity that it brought about that we're able to reach even more people and, and spread the gospel to other parts of the world. The current population of the world is roughly 7.7 billion people. That's an increase of about 82 million per year, which is about 224,000 per day. And there are 17,703 district, uh, district, distinct people groups in the world. And over 7,000 of these are unreached, which is about 40% of the world. That, 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 that means that there is a great need for assistance to reach them with the gospel. This is a big task. But God can use one who is willing and able to go because Jonathan of Israel Though Jonathan and Israel's enemies were defeated, remember this. Now, I, I gotta rephrase this right so that y'all understand what I'm talking about. See, this was a big task to be able to reach these 7,000 groups in the world that still have not heard the gospel. We know that when that one person, whoever that person may be, whatever time it may be, when the gospel is hit to them, that's when Jesus is gonna make his appearance. Some change is going to come about. Something's going to happen to let us know that the time is here, the time's not as near, the time is here, and that if you ain't in Christ, it's too late. See, but God can use one willing person in a great way. Through Jonathan, though Jonathan, or through Jonathan, Israel's enemies were defeated. It was through Jonathan, Israel's enemies were defeated. Now, I want you to understand that just like the 12 disciples turned the world, whole world upside down through the efforts of William Wilberforce, the slave trade was ended. Uh, when a, 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 a Judson, a preacher, started sharing the gospel in Burma, there was no church, no Bible, virtually no believers. When he died, there was 100 churches, 8,000 believers, and a finished Bible in their language. The harvest is plenty. But the workers are few. The good news is that God can use only a few to accomplish great things. He is not restrained to save by many or by few. In today's world, people seek ease, comfort, safety, convenience. They avoid trouble. They don't want, they worry too much. They find life so difficult. God does not call us to have a life of ease. God does not call us to have a life of comfort. God does not call us to have a life of pleasure. God calls us to make disciples. It's not easy. It's not comfortable. It's certainly not safe. So the people of God that God uses have their own unique roles. 
That would be my point four. So far, the focus has been on Jonathan, who stepped up and took the initiative. He took the lead. He, he served the mob as a model. But there were two key peoples in this story. The armor bearer was also had a very unique and important role. He was not as famous as Jonathan. He, his name was not even mentioned. But he, too, was willing to go. He, too, was brave. He, too, had faith. He too, sometimes we, we, we may be the first one to step out and take the initiative to build God's kingdom, uh, and that is good. At other times, we may be the other person who steps out and follows someone who's leading, and that is a good thing too. Yes, every person has a role in building the God's kingdom. Our role is not necessarily the same, but they are important, and they are just as important as the one who's leading. We work together in unity, for the common good. How do I know? Well, look at what Moses and, and, uh, and the followers there. I understand Moses had been given the vision to build the tabernacle. But God gave him a complete blueprint, blueprint of how everything was supposed to be constructed and put together. But he needed somebody who could do the work. And God anointed two others individuals, uh, Belial, and I can't say the other one, but I tell you what, it's all good. He gave them just as much of the information. In fact, he gave them the same information he gave Moses and gave them the same ability. And they were able to craft and put things together exactly how God wanted to be put together. And when they had done so, even Moses had to go back over everything to make sure everything was correct. It was an interesting thing. God can use anyone if they're willing to be used. Every person has a role in building the kingdom. Our roles are not the same, but they are together. They must, we all come together to work together. Do you know that what your role is in building the kingdom is? Are you willing to take it up? I hope that at the end of the day, at the end of this service, to answer both all these questions uh, will be resounding, will be a resounding, will be a resounding yes. My final point, two points that I want to put out there to you. I have seven. The person goes, the person that God uses recognize God's victory. See, in verse 12, Jonathan claims that the Lord has given them into the hands of the Israel. The Lord has given the enemy of Israel into the hands of Israel. In verse 15, we see that God sends a panic which engulfs the entire Philistine army. These verses remind us of the fact that God is one who gives victory. Not you, not me, not the world, not the government, but it's God that gives the victory. Proverbs 21, 31. The horse is made ready for the day of battle, but the victory rests with the Lord. Jonathan gives all the credit and all the glory to God, who was the one who deserved it. Whenever and wherever we serve God, we need to embrace the same attitude of humility. <coughs> Excuse me. Once we start becoming prideful and start trusting in ourselves, our own logic, our own reasoning, our own strength, we will not be effective. Can you persuade someone to believe in Jesus? Have, I have tried before. I have I, I gave the best evidence and arguments I could have. And the other guy was a lawyer. Hey, 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 you know? Because number one, there are those who really can debate. But in the end, as far as I know, he never believed. Knowing that we cannot persuade people forces us to rely on God and to pray for his spirit to work in their hearts. God can overcome, overturn all my weaknesses. This is not an excuse not to share the gospel, but it gives me the strength, gives me a calm confidence. It gives me the confidence to know that the Lord is on my side because I can't do it by myself. And point six, the person God uses can be a catalyst for the movement. But before Jonathan had taken action, 
The people were hiding in caves and resting in, under trees and no one was doing anything. And everyone was waiting for someone else to do something uh, uh, into this vacuum of vision. Uh, Jonathan steps up. He doesn't wait for someone else to make the first move. That takes a lot of bravery, a lot of guts. When Jonathan uh, stepped up and took the first step, God gave him victory. But then notice what happened to the rest of the Israelites. They all came out of their caves and joined the fight. They were inspired. They were motivated. A movement started which swept through the land and, and the Philistines were swept away. Luke 10, 12, uh, Luke 10, 2 says the harvest is plain, but the, the laborers are few. My hope is very simple, my brothers and sisters. I hope that each one of you will become a worker in God's harvest field. I hope that you will be a person that, will, uh, that God can use. I hope that you will work in the harvest field around you. I hope that as I pray for that movement will start with you and others will join you or if it's the other way around that someone around you started and you would join them, no matter what, it will bring about a change in this world. It will change the attitude of this world. It will bring us back in the right alignment with the God, with word, with the word of God. If you are willing to make the commitment before God, pray right now and, and tell him, are you, I am the person who is willing to be used by you, Lord, please stand by me. I pray thee. I, I, I want you to understand that pray in your own heart that God will make you into a person that he can use. Pray that he will help you be willing to go and show where you didn't want to go. He'll tell you where to go, when to do it, what words to say. Pray that he will give you a big vision, a giant vision, his vision. Pray that he will give you the faith. Pray that he will show you uh, your role. Pray that you will always rely on him and, and not on your own strength. Pray that you are a person that God can use. And if he uses you, don't hesitate to go because the victory is already yours. All you have to do is take those steps. Take that first step. Be the first, be the one that he calls and take the step to bring others to let them know that God has anointed you, God has called you, and that there's about a change about to come about because of power of prayer, because of power of God's word, because of the Holy Spirit that gives you the power to move forth and you'll be able to make a difference in this world to bring it back to let them know that the Lord is here and he wants to use you. It's time this time. I pray that you are that person that God can use. Amen. 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 Well, I hope that you heard this word and it was administered to your heart in a very special way. I hope that you understand that through this word, there is hope for us all. That God can bring about a change. It doesn't have to be a major change. It doesn't have to be something. It could be a small change, but nonetheless, a change nonetheless. So I, I'm asking and, and looking out there into the virtual world and those who are here, I pray that right now that in the name of Jesus, that if you have never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, uh, it, it's, the time is now. Don't delay and put it off. If, if it was any other way or any other way, I would have told you, but Christ is the only way. So I ask right now, pray this prayer. And not as that I am a sinner, Lord. I believe Jesus died for my sins on the cross and rose again on the third day. I repent of my sins and by faith I believe you, Lord Jesus, as my Savior. I receive you. You promised to save me. I believe you because you and God cannot lie. I believe right now that you, Lord Jesus, is my personal Savior and that all my sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. And through your precious blood, it was through your precious blood, I give you thanks, dear Lord, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. 
If you pray this prayer for the first time, or you prayed this prayer and you never really understood it, understand that God can hear, hear you, and if you confess Jesus as your Lord, you are saved. I personally want to welcome you to the family of God and rejoice with you. And let us know. We have address and telephone numbers, uh, website by which you can contact us, leave a message that you bought a globe or that you, your life was changed and you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Our advice to you was always to be, go ahead and join a church, a Bible-believing, Jesus-led church that believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and that as here in Quinn, if you want to come by, here we say that Jesus is Lord. He resides here. You have a blessed day. We pray that all those who are on the road, those who are traveling, for, we pray for your traveling mercy. We ask that you watch over and pray for our pastor and all those are, who are dealing with loss of loved ones or any other business at hand. I pray that all is well with you. Now unto him who is able to present us faultless before his honor of grace to the all-wise God. He pray he, he presents us with exceeding joy. And that all those know that through all the power and glory and the meaning that he has, he dwells with us forever and ever. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You'll be blessed. Have a great day.